most people and lots of people today still look down on the, those of us who um, are doing scholarly work in American musical theater. They think it's just singing hillbillies or it's it's just singing sorority girls if it's legally blonde or it's whatever. Um, but what scholarship is finding, both through looking at sources and um, how shows have been developed, their genesis, their evolution, to borrow terms from other disciplines. But what we are finding is that musicals um, tell us a great deal about ourselves as Americans, about our culture, um, and about our society and our relations. For instance, most people, at least a lot of people, um, if you say Oklahoma, probably think of a high school production with girls in gingham and, and boys in fake cowboy boots and chaps and singing nice little songs. But what Oklahoma is really about, um, given that it was written in 1943 and opened in Broadway during um, the Second World War and containing lyrics such as, we know we belong to the land and the land we belong to is grand, Oklahoma is really a document about what it means to be an American during the Second World War. Its story is about community coming together. The farmer and the cowman must differences to form communitas so that their territory can become part of the larger community of the United States. It's about Oklahoma on the verge of becoming a state, threatened from the outside as the country was in 1943 by dark forces that must either be changed or eliminated, as Judd Fry is indeed eliminated in the second act. Oklahoma is not just about cowboys and farmers and cowgirls, but indeed is about being American and being American at a very specific time in our history. That's just one example. The show that I'm going to talk about today, and I'm actually going to be, for the most part, reading a paper that is in the process of becoming an article. And it is about a musical that is not widely known outside of community theaters and high schools that seem to do it with some regularity and think it's great fun and nonsense. And that's the end of it. But as I am discovering, as I look at this um, text, uh, which is a problematic word, but I'll use it meaning the musical and the music and the choreography and the writing and everything else, um, that this, this show, uh, like Oklahoma does about 1943, the musical Lil Abner tells us a great deal about the United States in the middle of the 1950s, not long after the censor of Senator Joseph McCarthy and in the fervor of the Cold War years. So if you will indulge me as I stand here in Schwitz, what can I say? It's, it's, it's hot. Being, I don't know how many of you are from the South, but from this point on, being in the South in the summer is like having a fever for four months. <laughs> um, <laughs> so at any rate, um, Lil Abner, Corn Pone, and the Cold War. The, Jim, you're here again. You've already heard this paper once. <laughs> the cover of the March 31st, 1952, um, issue of Life magazine was devoted to an original drawing by cartoonist Al Cap. It featured his popular characters Lil Abner Yoakum, Daisy May Scrag, and Marion Sam. And it pictured the popular culture event of the year, truly, the wedding of Abner and Daisy May, an event that had been avoided by Abner for almost 20 years in Cap's popular comic strip. The marriage marked a change in the strip, if a relatively short-lived one, from political and social satire to a more domestic comedy. Writing in 1963 about this event, historian Arthur M. Schlesinger Jr. noted, quote, the new atmosphere is no longer conducive to the old escapes. To satirize the American businessman today, for example, example is to invite suspicion and attack. What was once satiric is now, in the business community at least, subversive. The most brilliant and daring of our comic strip cartoonists, Al Cap, finally had to marry off his two leading characters because no longer feeling himself free to kid hell out of everything, he felt he had no choice but to convert knockabout satire into a fairy story, end quote. Cap was even more direct about the event in an interview from the same year in the New Yorker's Talk of the Town, quote, McCarthy was coming to power and those were inconceivably terrible times. They got worse and worse until eventually, the only satire possible and permissible in this democracy of ours was broad, weak, domestic comedy. That's why I married off Lil Abner and began to concentrate on him again, 
end quote. And yet, in November of 1956, two years after the censor of Senator McCarthy, a musical version of, stri of Cat's Strip opened on Broadway that featured broad and considering the continuing paranoia of the Cold War era, somewhat startling political and social satire. Although this satire is couched in the kind of humor that once prompted Time Magazine to label Al Cap Rabelais for the retarded, <laughs> it is pointed and it recalls and at times amplifies much of the satire in Cap's earlier strip. Marshall McLuhan, no less, provides a succinct overview of Cap's work before 1952. And I quote, his keen eye for political, commercial, and social humbug is the result of a critical intelligence which is notably lacking at the more respected levels of writing. Cap looks at the disordered world around him not as a social reformer who imagines that much good would result from a few changes in external features of business and political administration. He sees these situations refracted through the deeply willed deceptions which every person practices upon himself. The criticism which is embedded in this highly parabolic entertainment, therefore, has a complexity which is the mark of vision. He moves in a world of many dimensions, each of which includes and reflects upon the other." End quote. These dimensions, which also exist and function in the musical, seem to have perplexed and or annoyed the show's critics, however. Time Magazine's reviewer noted that, quote, Cap's satiric eye notes and needles skullduggery, stupidity, conformity. But there are numerous occasions when the Cap menagerie let out of their neat newspaper cages noisily lose their way, stumbling in too many directions. Lil Abner has been swamped with plot, which not only palls, but plods, end quote. And in his next day review in the New York Times, Brooks Atkinson noticed that, quote, noticed Quote, on the whole, the composer and the writer of the lyrics, Gene DePaul and Johnny Mercer, have been luckier than the librettists, Norman Panama and Melvin Frank. And his subsequent review in the following Sunday's paper, he further noted that Panama and Frank, quote, have laboriously assembled a plot that involves some heavy-handed satire of the United States atom policy and the voracious greed of big business. To look at it from the point of view of craftsmanship, some simple people have been strangled by complicated plot maneuvers." End quote. Heavy-handed, perhaps. Surely no one who already knew the strip was expecting subtlety from Lil Abner. And yet, while the style of Lil Abner is conventional musical comedy with broad nods to burlesque and vaudeville, its content, which is situated within low comedy and high camp, is as political as nearly any other commercial musical of the decade. And although, as Stephen J. Whitfield has noted, Broadway audiences were a metropolitan, generally liberal clientele, Walter Winchell and Ed Sullivan were vigilant watchdogs for what they deemed pink to red influences on the otherwise great white way. Perhaps because the creators of Lil Abner knew that, at least in 19, knew that at least in 1956, audiences didn't take musical comedy very seriously. They were able to use the genre in general and the dim-witted Southern stereotypes in particular as masks for their social critique, a technique long before established by Cap in his strip. In a conversation with Ray Knapp when I first read this paper um, at a conference at the Graduate Center at CUNY, he told me that his colleague at UCLA, Rob Wasser, has referred to this phenomenon in Lil Abner as hick face. Um, our Dale Cockrell, uh, who has written much about blackface minstrelsy, has also referred to it as rube face. Uh, whichever, whichever term you use, the function of hick face or rube face or the mask is like that of blackface in early minstrelsy. The mask, regardless of its color, serves to allow a freedom of discourse otherwise unacceptable in performance. The musical social masks, which are of another socially marginalized group, in this case, poor white Southerners, seems to have been relatively successful. The musical remains a popular choice of high schools and community theaters that revel in its high-spirited numbers and groan-inducing puns, and remain only somewhat, if at all, aware of its context. Still, I maintain that Lil Abner um, is a potent statement about the post-McCarthy era Cold War and that it provides wonderfully stinging satire hiding just upstage of those singing hillbillies I mentioned before. 
Time prohibits me from exploring all the ways this is accomplished, so I shall focus on three of the show's principal targets. Nuclear testing and the powerful 1950s fear of and fascination with the bomb. Momism and the fear of demasculinization by a matriarchal society. And the fear of science and technology, particularly in regards to the conformity that both threatened to impose on society. So number one. After 1949, when the Soviet Union tested its first atomic bomb and the Cold War arms race began in earnest, Americans lived in a state of fear about the possibility of nuclear warfare. Best-selling fiction such as Neville Shute's 1957 novel On the Beach or Pat Frank's 1959 novel Alas Babylon, the first later filmed and the second made into a television drama, supported such apocalyptic ideas. The paranoia perhaps reached some kind of peak with Stanley Kubrick's 1962 film masterpiece, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. The public was encouraged to think of nuclear assault as the unprovoked act of the enemy, something seemingly inevitable, and, and Americans were equally encouraged to build so-called fallout shelters to protect themselves from the lingering radiation that a Soviet nuclear device would create. In, in, indeed, in 1951-52, New York Governor Thomas Dewey requested that $25 million in 1952 dollars, $25 million, be reapportioned for statewide bomb shelters. And in 1952, the state approved a large shelter in New York City. In 1955, Life magazine included an ad for what was called an H-bomb hideaway. The worry, of course, as advertising and the government suggested, was from without. The godless communists would think nothing of using such devices to annihilate American cities and eventually freedom and democracy itself. What most Americans didn't know, however, was that the biggest threat from atomic bombs in the 1950s came from their own government. This was especially true of a group of people in the Southwest who became known as downwinders, referring to their geographical situation to atomic tests that took place in the Nevada desert after January of 1951. The Nevada test site, first and somewhat tellingly called the Nevada Proving Ground, was approximately 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas, 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas. And during the 1950s, that newly burgeoning center for entertainment in various forms of legal and illegal recreations featured one other particularly unique form of tourist activity, observing giant mushroom clouds from atomic bombs det that were detonated and could be seen from hotel windows on the Strip. Little did they know that in 1997, the National Cancer Research Institute would establish that approximately 90 atmospheric tests at the Nevada test site, especially in 1952, 53, 55, and 57, deposited enough levels of radioactive iodine across the area to create between 10,000 to 75,000 cases of thyroid cancer, among other ailments. The damaging results of these tests are still being probed. Lo Abner taps into the public enthusiasm for the testing and the sense that patriotic duty outweighed any personal danger felt by the public, and it does so with predictable absurdity. The first 15 minutes of the show are pure burlesque. The only thing missing are baggy pants on the comedians, although those are replaced by bib overalls, and the rim shots following the punchlines, which are plentiful. The beautiful girls and scantily clad women are abundant as they are in cap strip, and the early songs range from exuberant, jubilation tea corn poem, to charming, if I had my druthers. But with the announcement of a town-wide corn poem meeting and the arrival of Senator Jack S. Fogbound, who the citizens view with suspicion and about whom they chant, there is no Jack S. like our Jack S., the tone, <laughs> that's the tone of the humor in this show, the, the tone shifts gears into satirical mode. Fogbound gets to the point of the visit, informing the population that you is going to save the lifeblood of a vigorous, thriving American industry, a glorious young industry devoted solely to the stimulation and relaxation for the American businessman, that industry known as Las Vegas. He then describes the fallout in Las Vegas that the desert testing is causing, the very fallout the contemporaneous US government was telling people was harmless, 
and he suggests that it is posing a danger to business and businessmen, although seemingly not to anyone else. He continues, do you think your government up here in Was up there in Washington is going to stand by and let a tragedy like this happen to an American industry so many have given so much for so little? He then informs the citizens that after a million dollar survey in his name, the government has located what Fogbaum calls the most unnecessary place in the USA to continue its nuclear testing. That place, of course, is Dogpatch. Just remember, Fogbaum entreats his constituents, your government is spending $1 million on one bomb just to blow your homes off the face of the earth. And like good Americans, everyone, the citizens of Dogpatch, immediately launch into a song and dance. <laughs> Don't that take the rag off in the bush, they sing. Don't that take the tassel off in the corn. Fogbound adds as he exits, of all the very ordinary, most unloved, unnecessary places on the earth, they settled on Yorn. The song is a mere 24 measures long, but it's followed by one of director and choreographer Michael Kidd's most exuberant dances, a dance that extensively celebrates nothing else than annihilation by nuclear bomb. I would like to play, I would like to play, oh, this went dark now. Am I, have I lost everything? Just, just hit play? Yeah. Abner and Daisy May and his mother and his father. Thank you. 
government up there in Washington is going to stand by and let a tragedy like this happen to an American industry. You do so many have given so much for so little. No! No, my fool. No, my friends. And that is why the Jack S. Paul Bound Committee has been chosen. To find a new place to test their atom bombs and guided missiles? Yes, sir. Some place we can blow off the face of the earth. Some spot that ain't never going to be missed. In fact, the most unnecessary place in the whole USA. Well, I'll be gone. Come on, then. And I now has the honor and the privilege of announcing that after a four-year government survey, all the no good, no account, unnecessary places in this whole country, you have been selected as the most unnecessary of all. <laughs> citizens. You all are going to be moved out of here by order of the United States government. And here's the fine government scientist who will supervise your evacuation. Citizens, meet Dr. Rasmussen T. Fensdale. <laughs> will be on Wednesday, but the evacuation will start immediately, so good luck and thank you. Yeah. And so, my dear constituents, as I bid you farewell, I bet you don't let me down. Just remember, your government is spending one million dollars on one bomb just to blow your homes off the face of the earth. So show your appreciation. I'll skip the dance, although it's pretty wonderful. It's some of Michael Kidd's best choreographer, choreography. For those of you who are, are dance people, it, it, Michael Kidd's one of the few choreographers who ever used double tours in, in Broadway choreography, which is when men dump, jump in the air and turn around twice before they come back down again. It's very impressive. That has to be one of the most surreal moments in all of musical comedy. And its dark subtext anticipates an almost equally surreal moment from a musical that came almost eight years later. Note this speech from a number titled Simple from Arthur Lawrence and Stephen Sondheim's Anyone Can Whistle. Quote, most of your money goes to the government in taxes. And what does the government do with most of the money? Make bombs. But you said that anyone who makes a product and doesn't use it is crazy. Doesn't that make you crazy for letting them waste your money? But perhaps the government is making bombs because it means to use the product, which means that all of us will be killed, which means that you are spending most of your money to have yourself killed, which means that you're mad. <laughs> Performed in a serious experimental musical that used madness and sanity as a concept for social criticism, this number all but disappears after nine performances. Lil Abner's celebration of a similar insanity nestled in an absurdly backward southern hillbilly community was performed 693 times. And American citizens continued to build their H-bomb hideaways well into the 1960s, oblivious to any absurdity at all. Mammy Yoakum, who we briefly saw, nay pansy hunks, I couldn't make that up, she was the dominant power in Dogpatch from her debut in Cap Strip. She is first introduced in the musical's opening number by her husband, Lucifer Ornamental Yoakum, better known as Pappy. As he sings, Mammy here is society's queen and she heads the local machine. Mammy takes over, noting I sweet but I's mystical and pugilistical, matter of fact, the champion. Indeed, Mammy's conversation ending phrase, I has spoken, is, an undisputed, is as undisputed as her lock on the political machinery of Dogpatch, such as it is. And when she needs to consult Mary and Sam about Abner and Daisy May's future, she tells him, I has to have a man-to-man -man talk with you. Pansy, indeed. Further, Mammy seems to embody many of the fears that Philip Wiley and other authors of the 1940s and 1950s saw as an increasingly dangerous and threatening phenomenon, the smothering and castrating mother 
Mammy is even more dangerous than most mothers due to her supernatural powers, those to which she refers when she calls herself mystical in the opening number, and which allow her to maintain a special control over her son's behavior and physicality. Abner's behavior, as well as his magnificent physical appearance, is due to Mammy's magical yokumberry tonic, which is created from the fruit of a tree that grows nowhere on earth but in her front yard, and which renders Abner physically perfect and self-adoring, but completely uninterested in women. Throughout the musical, he seems to have a sincere affection for Daisy May, but not of a romantic or certainly not of a sexual nature. Mammy, the controlling matriarch, powerful in her reach and gender bending in her methodologies, is surely Philip Wiley's worst nightmare. Wiley, a dyed-in-the-wool misogynist who blamed women for everything he saw or thought he saw wrong with American society, wrote his infamous book, Generation of Vipers, in 1942. But as K.A. Cordelion notes, quote, it launched an attack on American women and mothers that was culturally resounding and remained so well into the 1950s, end quote. Wiley's attack was merciless, brutal, and more than a little hysterical, referring to the destroying mother and the cult of mom, a cult worshipful of what Wiley saw as, quote, a mind-controlling totalitarian tyrant whose use of propagandistic techniques to elicit adulation of herself could rival that of Hitler or Stalin, end quote. You get the hysterical bent of this <laughs> writing. Indeed, Wiley referred to mom as commanding allegiance to her party, which he labeled shirtism, a reference to contemporaneous European totalitarian regimes of the 1940s. Other authors reflected Wiley's concerns and took them into even more specific territory. Journalist Max Lerner, for instance, in his 1955 study, American as, America as a Civilization, suggested that, quote, in cases where she, mother, is the dominant adult, the boy may find it hard to establish his own later role, having no masculine model, end quote. And less than a decade later, in her seminal work, The Feminine Mystique, 1963, Betty Friedan was even more explicit. Arguing that the smothering mother was the product of women's confinement to the home, Friedan suggested that the overpowering love of such mothers created a situation in which, quote, he, the son, can never mature to love a woman, end quote, but instead turns to loving men. Friedan continues, quote, his love for men masks his forbidden excessive love for his mother. His hatred and revulsion for all women is a reaction to the one woman who kept him from becoming a man, end quote. Of course, time has not been kind to this and Friedan's subsequent ideas that the overbearing mother was why, in her words, homosexuality was, quote, spreading like a murky smog over the American scene, end quote. But her observations certainly reflect the tone of the times. Abner, like his dominated father and all the other men in Dogpatch, obeys Mammy, although sometimes begrudgingly, and he never fails to take his Yokumberry tonic. Since he is the only citizen, Abner is the only citizen of Dogpatch who takes the tonic, he's the only one with the resulting attributes of narcissistic physical perfection and indifference to the opposite sex. His scrawny companions, while not eager to get caught during the ritualistic Sadie Hawkins Day race in which women chase and catch men who must then marry them, nonetheless demonstrate physical interest in the opposite sex. But Mammy and Pappy introduce Lil Abner in the opening number with the following somewhat awkward lyrics that nonetheless make their point. Quote, Lil Abner we has both learned still don't know how money is earned. His heart is the tenderest but neuter gender as far as the young gals is concerned, end quote. Tall, handsome, pumped, and gender neutral, Abner seems to embody the worst fears of reactionary social critics of the 1950s regarding the effects of a dominant mother. As Cudo Leone summarizes, a mother's gravest sin was, quote, that she emasculated her husband and engulfed her son, leaving the former mealy and henpecked and the latter hopelessly immature what Philip Wiley calls a lifelong sucking egg, who has sold his soul to mom. The psychological damage she did to her son in future generations was enormous, end quote. Mammy is a rustic example of this dreaded American archetype. Now granted, Wiley's images of mom are more um, cut of a, of a more middle class cloth. Think of Angela Lansbury in The Manchurian Candidate or June Cleaver with a malevolent subtext. Um, 
or Louise Fletcher, whose interesting um, performance as Nurse Ratched in the film of uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was sometimes criticized because she didn't play it as sort of this big dominant um, type, but instead was very soft selling of cruelty. That it, it's a, a, a stunning performance that very much uh, demonstrates this. But Mammy is Shirley Dogpatch's um, nominee to the 1950s pantheon of controlling and gender influencing moms, <laughs> nonetheless. Meanwhile, her Yokenberry tonic at first seems to promise Dogpatch's salvation from atomic annihilation. Because when the government realizes its powers, they postpone the bomb test to take the tonic, along with six scraggly men uh, from Dogpatch, to Washington, D.C. to test it. Unfortunately, they learn that although the tonic does indeed turn the men into perfect physical specimens, it also eliminates their interest in the opposite sex. Mother's milk equals deviant sexuality. When their girlfriends and our wives journey to the capital to see what has become of their menfolk, they're at first thrilled, clad only in posing briefs. The men appear to have stepped straight, well, maybe that's not quite the right word, <laughs> directly from the pages of a bodybuilding magazine. But the women soon observe, as one states that, quote, they have all turned into little Abners. <laughs> and they energetically sing of their men's former but now faded lustiness and potency. They was not known for beauty, but they showed them their duty, and they made the boudoir buzz. Or they was vile-looking varmints wearing vile-looking garments, but they know to his from hers. <laughs> you can't make this up. The second ly lyric again suggests that the effects of the tonic go beyond merely dulling interest in heterosexual sex and perhaps create confusion in sexual orientation. And the sameness of their physical perfection, they have virtually lost their individual identities and are, identifi by, are identifiable by their women only by the names on the back of their briefs, suggest a third target of the show's satirical thrust, the threat to individuality posed by science and technology. Until the scientists testing the tonic realize that it has potentially undesirable side effects on the sexual interest of the subjects, they are thrilled at the uniform perfection of the results. Early in the second act, they sing a song called Oh Happy Day that is nothing less than chilling in its projection of genetic engineering and its resultant conformity, a fear that was widespread, especially in relation to constructs of masculinity in the mid-1950s. The lead into the song, for instance, consists of scientists extolling the day when we can make mankind look, act, think, feel, hope, desire, dream, buy, sell, inhale, exhale, exactly like those specimens over there. Then they point to the new models of manhood created by Mammy's tonic. The scientists then burst into song, as folks are wont to do in this show, as we've seen, in a bright 2-4 chorus in which their glee approaches the ominous. Oh, happy day when miracles take place and scientists control the human race. When we assume authority on human chromosomes and assembly line women conveyor belt men is settled down in push button homes. The song continues referring to slenderella type mothers and muscle beach dads living in gymnasium homes. But perhaps the most unsettling verse then and now is Oh, happy day when in collective brains no individuality remains. We'll be a race of busy bees in happy honeycombs with automaton couples, mechanical guests getting gassed in self-service homes. How far, I wonder, are those happy honeycombs from the H-bomb hideaways mentioned earlier? This song, which was omitted from the film uh, version, which we watched earlier, is almost over the top even for Lil Abner which already seems to invented a new top to go over. The pressures of conformity in particular among men in their new post-war organization man mode, to borrow William H. White's terms, fits it into the fear of female dominance that I've already discussed. White and David Riesman, whose 1950 book, The Lonely Crowd, also addressed the diminution of American individuality, wrapped their observation in sexually overt terms. Both use a hard, soft idiom to compare the changes from 19th century individuality to mid 20th century conformity. For instance, Riesman referred to what he deemed the formerly inner directed man, that is one whose values and esteem were self-possessed, as hard. Such a man confronted the hard material world with a hard enduringness. 
Today, Riesman further notes, it is the softness of men rather than the hardness of material that calls on talent and opens new channels of social mobility. Even Adlai Stevenson, a stalwart standard of mid-century liberalism, reflected these, gender, these gendered images in an address to the graduating women of Smith College, no less, in 1955. This borders on, on being satire itself. For example, regarding conformity, quote, while I am not in favor of maladjustment, I view this breeding of mental neuters with grave misgivings, or, you may be hitched to one of these creatures we call Western man, and part of your job is to keep him Western, to keep him truly purposeful, to keep him whole. What you young ladies have to do is rescue us wretched slaves of specialization from further shrinkage and contraction of mind and spirit." End quote. Stevenson and many others from both sides of the political aisle more and more viewed industry, research, science, and their increasingly omnipresent white collar or white lab coat uniforms as threats to the perceived essentialism of American masculinity. And as the scientists of Lil Abner represent those threats, they are in no uncertain terms. This presentation today barely cracks the surface of this problematic, culturally significant, and thoroughly enjoyable musical comedy. Um, I plan to unpack this a bit more in an article that I'm working on uh, right now about this show, mostly because I think it contains more information about the Cold War era than almost anyone has ever thought, and more than most Broadway musicals of the 1950s, although there are some others that enter into the discussion. Behind its mask of hick face, its carnivalesque flaunting of propriety and seriousness is, is a potent and important satire, I think, from this era. And don't that just take the rag off in the bush. <laughs> Thank you.